we I think we're alive. You are indeed. And live. And as I say, nothing else going on this afternoon uh, to distract us from welcoming you to this uh, wonderful exhibition by Sarah Poland at Oriel Q in Narbeth. Um, as you can see just from the works behind us, it's, it's, a, it's a large, generous, and stunningly energetic uh, exhibition of paintings. And it's my pleasure to welcome Sarah and my honor to be here talking with her. We, we know each other a little bit, but um, I hope we're in the perfect situation because although I know some things about you, and we've met a couple of times and I've been to your studio, I don't really know you. And I'm still coming to terms with the work and and although I've seen you in other group exhibitions, this is the um, the first large solo show that I've seen. You must be very excited and very pleased by this. I am, yeah. And it's a, it's a, this is a great space, isn't it, too? It's, it's, um, I mean, it's, when it's completely empty as well, it's, it's somehow it, it depends what's in it. Um, it can kind of get bigger or shrink, um, depending on, on the work. Yes, great. Well, the work looks great here. Um, we, we, we had seen uh, you in a group show in Oriel Marvin in Carmarthen recently, where one of your paintings, is it the one downstairs? Or, or um, no, but it's, yeah. A similar one, yeah. yeah. Uh, occupied the whole one end wall and again, just looked great. Yeah. These, these paintings need the right context, don't they? They need to be shown in space particularly these, the, these big works. Why are you painting so big? It's, it's commercial suicide. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, there's the, the physicality of making them, and it's, it's all about, um, these ones are about my experience of living in woodland near here, big 80-acre um, woodland. And um, the, the experience is intense. Um, when you're making small works, it's more about just your, your hand, isn't it, and arm, and but this is this is physical, and I think of the viewer as well. When you approach large pieces, your um, your response isn't just in the mind; it's in the body as well. You, um, you, you kind of become more a part of, of that. You're, like these are my sons. I can pick them up, and reach across, and um, it's about my physicality as much as. Most people say, oh, it, you know, it's abstract art. These, these are hovering, it seems to me, between abstraction and, and figuration because um, if you, we, we were recently on the continent and looking at Kandinsky, there are a couple of Kandinsky paintings you look at and they are abstract art. You, you know, they, they, they depict nothing apart from the gestures, the the, the act of making and, 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 and the resonance between colors and shapes. Um, but here, I mean, one is seeing um, some aspects of woodland, of light and shadow, light coming through trees and boulders. And uh, whenever one looks at abstract art, we want to make something of it. There's a challenge to make something of it. Now you subvert that in a sense here with, with, with uh, this uh, vertical uh, triptych um, which appears to challenge us to make mm. the real world out of it. You're, you're about painting as much as you are about the woodland, the experience, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and when once you get into big brushes and thick paint, it's really you, you really get get lost in it. I, when you were speaking, then I was thinking about this um, kind of. Maybe it's obsession. The British can't really let go of representation. Oh, it's the English, you know, not the British. <laughs> we have this um, kind of idea that's, that's stuck. I mean, we have some fantastic abstract painters, Richard Riley, um, Ian McKeever, uh, but really we're always looking for something. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't call myself an abstract painter. This is all coming from from somewhere, and it's started in this woodland, I've taken it further. Um, it's not purely figuration, but it's, it's definitely of this place, and um, abstraction somehow is, is, is comes from some, it comes, it comes from somewhere, but it's kind of pure in a different, different way. You're not drawing objects. I mean, this triptych 
Triptychs are often um, horizontal, aren't they? Yeah. It's like the icon and the Mother, Mother Mary. And um, I wanted to do it the other way around and make it landscape based. And really, I was I was trying it out. Um, try the triptych this way because as soon as you if you turn it round, you immediately think of this um, traditional. Uh, what's it called? The, the three going that way. The, Kind of iconographic. Yes, yeah, yeah, like the eyes and yeah. We, yeah, again, we, we saw that recently, this yeah. astonishing, the greatest painting in Europe, yeah. you know, where you, you have got the, that, that, uh, the crucifixion and, and then, yeah. you know, the, the, the even, narratives which side of it. And you want to avoid that. And, and even and Bacon has his, his triptych. His, indeed, um, yeah. indeed. And I wanted to, to get away from that. And even with these, they're, you can see, but they're off squares. Um, the square is, to me, so heavily steeped in, in modernism, and um, it's got its own problems, the square, and I just didn't want to do landscapes, a shape that's just slightly off. And but there are, two, there are two narratives, if I can editorialize it, there are two narratives here. I mean, you, you, you are art trained. I mean, you've done the stuff, you've read the books, you, you, you've, you've talked about the influence of the writings of people like Motherwell and, 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 and Riley and McKeever, which we spoke about uh, just before coming here. Um, so you, you, you've got that art background, you've got that uh, literacy in art, but then you've got the, the need to respond to what is immediately in front of you. And you're talking about the wood. Now, the wood is south of St. Clair, it's just, what, 15 miles yeah. or so from here. And um, we, what we have got, interestingly, in a contemporary British uh, uh, art narrative is people like David Nash, Goldsworthy, Richard Long, going out into nature and not taking it back and putting it on canvas, but in, in Long's case, of bringing back the stones and then creating something in the studio. David Nash working with wood, working almost exclusively with wood. And then Goldsworthy you know, taking photographs of these, these, these momentary art shapes that he makes with leaves and twigs and so on. But you quite deliberately undertake a sort of pilgrimage into this wood. I mean, you, 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 you literally lived in the wood for a while. Yeah. What was, were you running away from something? Or, or, were you, or were you running into something? What was that about? Um, the, um, I don't know, if I, if I just say I before that I spent, I grew up in Scotland and I spent 10 years in Cornwall in northern Scotland where the landscape is very low, low hills, um, not many trees um, in the valleys, but not many trees, maybe telegraph poles are the, the, kind of the markers. And, um, and then I ended up in this woodland, almost accidentally I chose to stay so deliberately, in this woodland surrounded by trees and the whole is off grid, the whole experience is really intense. Mm. And um, either, I, either I ran away from that and painted something else, or um, kind of, I just had to deal with these trees somehow. Um, mm. So running away from anything, I think I wanted to fully immerse myself in something and be distracted from nothing except that, and get back to the kind of basics of living. Back like to nature. Collecting water. Yeah. And making yeah, how did you live? What did you? I mean, you didn't, you didn't forage for berries and well, kill yeah. rabbits and things. Did you? Yes. I mean, did you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm a big forager. Yeah. Um, we grew vegetables. We went to shops. Um, and uh, there was a spring, so I collected water. Right. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it, it takes time. It's, it's as beautiful as it is tough. But it, um, you must have popped into you know spa in St Clair's occasionally. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But we did have rabbits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then literally collecting um, collecting various foraged foods, but um, oak pull, which um, on the end wall, all done is oak pull ink. Um, I had a baby by then, and um, was pushing. It's an eighty acre woodland. And Pushing the pushchair around, walking the dog, walking the baby to sleep, and um, there, were, there was a timber framer in the woods, and there was a blacksmith. Okay. And um, he's me making paintings, and buying paints. And I wanted to make something off the woodland, like they were, um, using the oak trees and 
making buildings, making um, sculptures, making charcoal for, for the foundry. And then someone happened to say, oh, do you know, you can make ink from oak gum. And that just led me on this journey. And as I'd be pushing the push chair, and I was walking around this wooden like this, just picking up oak gold. And I spent about eight months with my head down, you know, rubbing <laughs> my neck. And, um, yeah, just discovered this amazing so, ink. So, so the wood is, in, in a superficial sense, the subject of the paintings. It's the occasion, yeah. it's the motivation, living there, mm -hmm. absorbing it, leads to the paintings. Yeah. But then the stuff of the wood actually is, is one of the materials that yeah. you use. Yeah. I, I mean, most people, I don't know, has anyone heard of oak gold? It wasn't something that I was familiar with. You have, it's my ignorance, I failed a little art. Yeah. Um, oak gold didn't appear there. I, was, was, did yeah. you know about this, or well, was it something that you researched? Probably as a poet, it's, um, it's nicknamed Ink of Poets and Kings, and um, it, it's still used in official manuscripts. It was um, it's an indelible, probably the only indelible um, ink made from plants. Okay. Most of the fugitive. Okay. And um, it was used on vellum for official documents. Um, and I suppose poets, you know, it's a, it's a good ink. I, I, from tomorrow, I oh, should use so. nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> But, but yeah, but that was that, that was that was a, that was not happenstance. That was a gift. Clearly, you were meant to be there. Yeah. You, were, you were meant to be using that stuff, weren't yeah. you? But you said, I mean, there was a there was a wood person, and and, and I know that your your husband, your partner, makes uses wood, makes makes eco friendly, low carbon buildings. Mm -hmm. So the, this is part of a philosophy that you guys share, anyway, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. You know, you. you and it made sense to, for me to try and make something of, of being, you know, of the woodland from being there. Um, I still have a deep kind of passion for oil paint, mm. but, um, but that's what the, the later, the most recent works are. Um, and with them, I've, I've joined them with, uh, so, it, you know, this, this woodland living was completely immersive and I love to walk the dog at night and I take my camera out, baby's asleep, walk the dog around and um, the, the photographic pieces are a long exposure on the camera and using the moon as a light source and so it, I call them moon drawings and then depending on, you know, I use the trees as a filter, um, if they're not there it's a hard line, it's, it may as well be a marker pen, so using the trees as a filter you can then really play around with Mm. drawing with the moon. So and, and over lunch you were talking about the, the, the variation in, in, in light, that the wood mm. obviously changes with the seasons, yeah. obviously, yeah. but the light, the whole character of the wood changes. And, 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 and also you said that go, when, you, when you opted to go to the West Country, but the light there was quite different from what, you, what yeah. you'd experienced in Scotland. Yeah. Um, I mean, light, I think, no matter what you're painting affects affects it. Even if you're not painting light, um, how your studio is, I mean, it, on a very kind of, um, on one level, it just affects your mood, doesn't it? Um, the, the light coming in affects the color of the paint. Um, I went to Shetland and the, the light there was pink. And yeah. I think of, of magic. Um, in fact, a lot of this pink comes from that experience and that idea and that magic is pink. <laughs> um, uh, go to the Hebrides and it's very blue and you said the same time as in West Cornwall, Penzance and it's, it's a very bright white light. You know, even on a, a grey day you'd be kind of squinting. Um, in fact the artists there in the Port Mere studios, they have their windows painted out, whited out because it's so bright. Right. And also the views too, beautiful distractions. <laughs> It seems, yeah, ironic, but... You, you were born in Inverness, you grew up in Scotland, you naturally had the choice of, you know, Edinburgh or Glasgow, you, you applied for Edinburgh. Um, but then you did fashion, didn't you? And you kind of, you, you moonlighted, um, that's not too obvious, a, yeah. a, a, a trope, um, from, from fashion. You, did, you, 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 you attended fine art classes, you felt that that was 
going on in parallel to it. But you made clothes, you said? And I did. And um, it's funny, I wanted to, I kind of wanted to paint as well. And um, in my application for Edinburgh, a lot of my portfolio was seascapes um, on about the sea. Um, and in some ways, got quite abstract. But my, my fashion collection was also about the sea. And you had these kind of billowing, wearable, it's, I mean, it's wearable sculpture, but um, being wearable was the, the key as well. Yeah, but I was interested in history of art, not history of design. Um, so I went to those and came out and started painting. So, so your, 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 your degree show was essentially fashion, yeah. was it? Yeah. yeah, with painting, of with, 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 yeah. Okay. I did have, I had um, paintings of the sea on the wall. And what did you think you were going to do after that? Not that I'm naive enough to think that any art student knows what they're going to do, apart from form a rock band or whatever, I don't know. Um, I still make clothes. I, I, I've always sewn and painted and cooked uh, in various kind of degrees in my life. And um, I think I thought, I, I went down to London and I thought I'd better like, do some fashion work experience and I started painting. Um, it was when I went to Cornwall, I made this move. You know, I've known nothing about Cornwall. Nothing about St. I mean, can you believe it? St. Ives, Newlyn. I was going there for the for landscape and um, to commit myself to painting full time. Mm. Um, so I did that, and then. So at least you went there carrying no baggage of expectation, you yeah, know. Yeah. Yeah. No baggage of art school, even. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you get there, and then every second person is an artist. It's quite amazing. Mm. And you've been showing them, haven't you? Yeah. Belgrade Gallery's yeah. been showing you in St. Ives, yeah. and they've been quite loyal to you. And how has that been then? So you've been going back and yeah, I had a show taking the work down there, but not staying there and painting, presumably. That's right. right. 2016, yeah. I had a show. Um, so this exhibition is this kind of woodland project, as I loosely call it. It's about it's in its seventh year. Um, so I took some of it down to Cornwall mm -hmm. and built that gallery. Um, there are a few crossovers. Of paintings and one there, um, a couple of lithographs. And I wouldn't normally repeat work in a show, but um, because this is part of this project, it's right here at St. Clair's. It's almost like bringing it home. Um, and I'm living here now. I'm definitely rooted in Wales, and it seemed like a, you know, my first exhibition, just a chance to put it all together and add the new stuff. And Okay, you're, you're anchored here and you've got yeah. a growing family and obviously yeah. Yeah, you're, you're, not, you're not passing through. You, you, you're training in terms of making, in terms of fashion and so on. Have you, I don't know whether you have, have you been tempted to do, to, to, to respond to the, were you tempted to respond to the woodland experience in any 3D work? You said there was a wood turner there. Your husband obviously works in wood. Um, wood you know about you know Nash, Long, Goldsworth. You know, say these these people who are who are in nature, making of nature. Have you been tempted to do that? Have you taken photographs of? Uh, yeah, no, I haven't. I seem to be a very two-dimensional flat painter. Kind okay. Of person. Yeah, if it gets three-dimensional, it's literally about the body and making clothes, and that's just yeah, that's just something else. Okay, you're a painter. I make clothes for my son and my sure. family. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And then another aspect of things, because this is not just an exhibition of paintings, and you're not just a painter, but the printmaking is quite important to you. Oh, yeah. And that was through meeting Paul Croft, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. At so I went. Um, well, no, I went to. I was actually I was down in Cornwall, and I used to travel to Dartington um, in Devon. They've got a printmakers' workshop. Yeah. And there's a painter there, Michael Honor, who runs it, and. He's, he's into lithography and he kind of showed me a couple of techniques and then just left me to it. And it was at the far end of the studio and it's like at the hot end and the sun beats down and any lithography, was, you know, it was the only option, you know, but any lithography studio at Aberystwyth School of Art is down in the basement, it's cool. And I spent about eight years in Dartington just kind of trying to work it out and um, everything possible going, going wrong. Um, 
And then Michael said, oh, there's this guy called Crofts. He's, um, he's written a book. Why don't you, why don't you get that? I'm like, OK. And I got his book, and then it turned out he um, was doing a master class in Stroud for four days. So I went straight there. And then he said, um, it all seems to be kind of happenstance, really. He said, oh, yeah, I work at Aberystwyth. And you know, Paul Croft is a, a master printer. He, he went to um, Tower End Institute in Albuquerque. And um, he's a fantastic teacher. And he's teaching at Aberystwyth on the master's course. So that was, you know, I went there to learn photography with a master printer. And um, lithography is perfect for painters. It's direct. You draw on the stone, mm -hmm. whatever the support is. And it kind of, you know, making paintings. And sometimes you need to do something else, stay in the practice. But lithography works. Over the years, and I, 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 I bought a collected print, some paintings, but people are a bit confused about printing. They, they're, 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 there is no such thing as a print, there's lithography, there's etching, you know, screen printing and so on. And then this awful thing, this, this <laughs> I, I hesitate to say the word. <laughs> Well, of course, she she sort of, yeah. you know, yeah. it's possible now, it, of course it's possible to reproduce with some accuracy an original image, you know, a million times, yeah. with the same sort of quality. It's not, it's not an etching, but it is. I'm um, really rude about it. I call it the kind of expensive photocopy. Good. Um, it's when people, you know, don't understand, so there's some learning to be had, but... Um, they say, oh, no, no, I don't want to print, I want an original. Yes. So then, but, you know, it's quite hard to explain the difference. Um, it really is. And there are painters not a thousand miles from here who, 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 who've knocked out, you know, limited editions of 500 mm -hmm. of, of one of their paintings. I and, just and wish they'd call it a poster. That's, that's fine. Yeah. I'm so pleased that you're so <laughs> rude about it because I, that empowers me to be rude about it as well. It, yeah, it's just, it's not printing. Printing is, as, as I know and as you've experienced, is a hands-on experience. It's an original work. It just happens more than once. But it shouldn't happen more than like 50 times or whatever, you know. And, and, and Mark and I, some years ago, we, we went south of Cambridge and visited, you know, the great... Uh, 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 Stanley at 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 Kerwin Press, yeah. you know Sam Jones, and and this is serious printmaking, you know, and there was Kelpra doing screen print, wasn't it? And Kerwin, and Kerwin, some of the greatest artists in the country worked at Kerwin, and they went there and they did something on stone or whatever, original. It was an original work. They were hands on and proper printmaking. The artist is there and not numbering or signing until they say it's what they intended. It's not a machine in Hong Kong knocking it out. Uh, this is a problem. You've got to negotiate that, or the public has got to negotiate yeah, that. I think they? in defense of the, I don't want to call them the consumer, but the, the buyer, <laughs> um, there's, n there's nothing wrong with a poster, but call it a poster. Mm. What they're being sold is something that they think is original, and um, it's, you know, you can buy posters in the Tate, and I do see nothing, nothing wrong with that. <coughs> But it, um, it's misleading, it, and they get numbered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the whole point of an etching is, as as uh, there is a finite life to uh, proper printmaking. You know, you can't get that many from it because it starts to degrade and it gets worn and so on, as we know. I tend to do ten or twelve lithographs, um, unless it's for I don't know a portfolio or something. But ten or twelve, because then I mean you've got storage. You've got um, you've kind of got the want to make another image, not mm. just keep mm. making another copy mm. of another, mm. another issue. One of we, one of our great pleasures, we got to know David Nash, and and, and every Christmas we get a he does he does a print for sort of friends and acquaintances, and that comes, and it's just a high point of every Christmas, you know, and 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 and, and he's a very good printmaker, but he's got a whole house in in uh, uh of where he lives which is just just for the prints the printmaking is serious yeah. one of your wonderful prints is is, is um, which you've done in in, in several ver several versions is the woodland 
but but the uh, I can now call it the infamous bath is there. Oh, yeah. You have this bath there, and it's got two taps on it. But you, I guess you put the plug in, you fill it with water from the spring, no doubt. From a river. Yeah, and you lit a fire under it. Yeah. And took a bath in it. Yeah. You're mad. <laughs> what was that? Um, well, it's uh, it's an amazing experience. Yeah. It's, um, plug in, fill a bucket, fill it from the river, um, collect the wood. And does your man servant light the fire? Because I, I can't imagine that you lean out and add a few... I mean, how well, does it physically know, work? It, it, you know, it's sort um, of one person endeavour, this, is it? Could be, but it's fun with two. Um, it's, uh, it takes a while. You've got to put this corrugated iron goes over the top of the bath, keep the heating, and then heat the fire. It's not uh, efficient, but it's beautiful, and you Soaking the fire, it takes you know it takes a few hours to heat up. Um, at which point, you know maybe it's getting dark. Um, you've got the smoke, the steam, um, and down in the valley, the trees are really tall. So you 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 have to oh, you have to sit on a plank of wood by the way because otherwise you burn your bum. <laughs> and, um, Good to know. You might have you, know, you might have stars over here. Artists suffer for their art. I know that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's just, you're out there in, in a woodland, in, in nature, and um, you're in the bath, you're naked, and yet it, it's just a really physical, visceral experience. Maybe the Milky Way, the overhead stars, you know, it's a... Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, I, I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to work on that one. <laughs> So there you are in your bath, like it's almost like a Morris Sendak child story, isn't it? You're, you're sailing in your bath through the, through yeah. the magical wood. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's you, magic. Maybe that would be something for your kids. So it'd be something to do. The, the 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 darker side of things, which you just mentioned before we started, John Red, ah, an, uns, an unsought for uh, visitor in the woods, didn't you? The black which, the Black Panther. <laughs> yeah. We're not talking American political movement of the 60s here, we're talking about yeah. St. Clair's, Carmarthenshire, and you yeah. saw... This, this um, woodland is, is 80 acres, and it's got some, some really wild parts of it, where no one goes. Um, yeah, I was there one day, one, one kind of towards dusk, walking my dog, and she started barking, different barks. Barks for different things, and um, this was a I'm chasing a large mammal type bark, um, like she's chasing a deer. And I, I've never seen any deer in the woodland, so I thought, well, okay, I'm just going to stand here, and um, she's coming towards me now, and see, see, just see what happens. It's not going to notice me being chased by this barking dog. And then I looked up the track, and 100 meters up the track, this, this black panther just kind of just completely silently. Padded over the path and then down across through the thick bit of woodland. And I mean, my dog lost her at the river and she's going around in circles. Where, where is this thing come from? Where is this thing? And um, I guess it's the, the beast is somewhere, but it was mm. so beautiful. And um, yeah, it took, took, took my breath away. It made me think um, again about going out without a torch. And <laughs> Yeah. So um, this wood becomes, 
it's obviously a very special place for you, mm. but it becomes a, a place of visitation. You are visiting it, you are committing yourself to it by living in it. But you, you know, you've got the cosmos coming in, you've got a black panther, mm. it is claimed. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, and, and, and so it becomes a place of endless possibility mm. for you, really. Transformation. And yeah. And it takes itself beyond just the woodland. That, the biggest piece there is that's about meeting the panther. It's still very much about the bath and the smoke and the steam and the trees as the kind of um, beginnings of it. But it's called Savage Grace. Can, can we can we switch around? Can we show folks that? Check check the floor. It's called Savage Grace, which yeah. is the part which alludes to the, the panther. When I spoke to others who've been in the woodland and mentioned the panther, thinking I'd be laughed laughed at, but then someone else said they'd seen half a sheep's carcass of a tree. And someone else had seen these eyes in their head torch. Turned around and then the other day. You never, my dad says, you never hear the, um, the panther that gets you. <laughs> and then you sign up. So it was there and then it was there, its eyes. So, you're. An it's true. All right, I'm, of course it's true. Of course it is. You're, you're now in. I don't know, mid career, but in sort of in, in midlife, you've got another child um, with all the responsibility that that brings. Um, how, where do you see yourself? Is this is this a sort of closure about this experience, or is the or is the wood, the woodland experience going to be infor informing your work, if not directly, at least as a, as a kind of background noise for for, mm -hmm. for the foreseeable future? What are you doing now? How recent are these? Well, the ones in that end wall are um, the most recent, using the oak wall link and the oak, yeah, photography. Yeah, yeah. And um, I'm really excited about those. It's still, mm. it's off the woodland, it's still about it. Um, and yeah, I'm, I've got some stretchers ready to make some oil paintings. More like the the smaller ones in perspex there, yes. but bigger, bigger oil paintings. Yes. That kind of. Um, and and they work individually, but also I mean, folks can't see them. But in triptychs and diptychs, they, they they resonate, but they are freestanding as yeah, well. Yeah, they are. And because of the perspex, there there is no frame. I mean, your frames are unobtrusive mm -hmm. in the sense that, yeah. certainly in a gallery like this, it appears that the, the paintings are, are floating on the wall, and that's what that's what mm -hmm. you want. And yet they're contained. The, this this exhibition, luminous light dazzling, luminous light dazzling night, um, is about light, is about perception, but also the spiritual yeah. importance of that. Mm. And these paintings are very much about your being right, particular, in a specific place, but your being in the world. And, and certainly the, the, the ones at the far end are, seem to be stretching out towards infinity in, in the sense that there's not, a, there's not a natural perspective there. You're, you're, you're playing with day and night and you're playing with distance. And they're and probably the most abstract, really. Um, spiritual? Um, yeah, it's all about my human experience really and um, well they're not processed they're, they're certainly playing with the materials mm. and and the light I mean the, the photography is at night um, but you know the woodland was kind of in some ways at its best at night and in winter um, which might sound surprising but the most light comes through in winter and the leaves have gone and this light comes through um, Summer is heavy, isn't it? It's heavy and green and damp and, you know, it's got its own kind of virulence, virulence but um, it's kind of emptier. Going back to the emptier landscapes of Cornwall yeah. and Shetland, it's, I, uh, yeah, I like that emptiness. It's, car it's kind of coming into a, a calmer place, I think. This right. is all, you know, the savage grace in these ones, they're really busy and physical. 
I say because, I mean, it's again, hard. it's a cliche, but apt, the, the abstract, American abstract expressionism, and we both saw that, that astonishing show in the Royal Academy last mm -hmm. year, didn't we? It was, it was very male, it was very physical, it was Jack the Dripper, wasn't it? What a shame there weren't more women in there. Well, there weren't so many women in art, it would appear. Well, um, now we know there are, that they, you know, they, 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 they're Lee Chrysler and, 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 and um, Joan Mitchell. Joan Mitchell, yeah, tremendous yeah, painter, yeah. Um, but there's a physicality with, with these particularly. I can see you, I can see, there's, there's a muscularity about the, uh, uh, about the making of them, but, but, um, Motherwell, one of those those great mid-century American artists, is someone that you you quote as an influence in terms of his writing. But Motherwell talks about um, the happenstance of things, mm. uh, almost a surreal, you know, drip and see what happens and take it from there. Yeah. Is 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 that something in terms of methodology that you've employed? Um, I'd say in terms of automatic painting, or um, or even more so, um, they're improvised. Related to music, um, okay. where I mean, I, I I don't really stand back and look at a painting. I don't stand back and, and think, oh, what's next? Um, it's very much close up with it. It's like a mm. oh, wrestling is not the right word at all, but a dance. That's a better word. Okay. A dance, and it's um, it's improvised and it, it happens. And actually, at some point, I try to to see the painting. I try to detach myself. Once I've, I've done that, I try and see it almost as someone else, or as much as I can. Um, do, do members of your family, do friends come and, I mean, uh, do you show work that's in progress? No. Or, no. Because yeah. some people do that on Facebook now, and I think, why are you showing me this? You know, started a painting last night. Oh, no. no, that's your business. Yeah. Don't share it on Facebook. You wouldn't dream of doing that, would you? That's, no. No. Um, no, they're all finished. I mean, I might show a drawing. Yeah. But um but a finished one? I'd say yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's ready ready to see. Mm. Um I take photographs of myself and I find it quite interesting seeing the progress. Right. And um you can see where you see several paintings happening. Mm. Um but they, I also you know, I like to work wet and wet and that means there's a certain time limit on it. Um I don't scrape down like Frank Auerbach. You know, again, like an analogy for music, um, if you're playing a piece of music, you you tend to start again. If you want people to hear it, you have to start again. It's linear, mm. isn't it? Okay. You can't just carry on. So if it, if it dries or, you know, in a few weeks' time I come back to it, I have to start again. Um, so there are several going on at the same time, and I'll move between, between a few, but I'm not standing back and a bit in because that bit is then it's separate and it's on top. It's the wet in wet painting right. that it's got to be the two be together. What an intriguing things for me. Does that make the, sense? Yeah, no, it does make sense. And one of the intriguing things for me over the years is interviewing painters is going to studios and and there ain't no rules. Everybody works is able to work in a different way or has to work in a different way. I mean, uh, one of our very close friends, paints, listening to the football on a Saturday afternoon or listening to the arches or whatever. Mm. Um, some people paint the music, some people must have no, nothing yeah. distracting them at all and they're just zeroing in on that square or rectangle and, and, and the whole universe is there for the time that they're yeah. doing it. There's no rule, you have to do what you do. I used to paint with music on and the radio on, um, but then I found that, you know, if you're listening to good music, then I just sit down and listen. And I don't I don't have time for that. No. Uh, when I'm in the studio, I'm in the studio, I, I will listen to music, but um, I just found that was taking over and uh, I just needed to get on the paint. So here you are, there are three canvases, the three blank canvases, you, you're priming them in some way, or how, what, what, is the, what is the actual process? Are you making marks of charcoal or graphite, or, or are you going straight on with paint? Um, they're primed, um, primed with uh, either rabbit skin glue or an oil primer. Um, this one's actually 
mostly acrylic. I think that's just an acrylic primer on that. I go straight in with a brush, big brush. Tend to work with two brushes, um, or two of the same size and get right. in each hand. But um, you know, a wide brush, if it's quite thin on its side, it becomes a thin brush. And that way you can become really involved and less sort of distracted by you've got cut my colours and they just kind of launch at it. Okay. Make the dance. And but did this start as, as as a long panel or was it always going to be a triptych and and you, you said that possibly if one turned it on its side, yeah. and that is a possibility with, with, I mean, Pollock is painting on the floor, isn't he? Yeah. At what point does he decide to put it crudely, which way is up? Yeah, I think spinning a painting is always a great technique for seeing how imbalanced it is. And, yeah, um, but, also, but also letting the paint, if it's really fluid, run, run yeah. its course, as it were. Yeah, but I like working flat for that reason. Yeah. Um, this one, I mean, I wouldn't literally turn it side on. I just meant if that was the way of the triptych. But this, they started out individually. And then I had these three paintings. And I just thought, well, what if I put that one on top of that one? Or what if it went underneath? And I was trying these different configurations. And then I realized how they actually matched up. I mean, there were lines that I hadn't, once they put together, I hadn't gone over and joined them up. Or Yes, the black bit. And then the bits that don't quite match up are interesting as well. Yeah. And, yeah. and I had I had this idea of a triptych like that, but then it all came together with, on this piece. And, then and at what point is the red added? I know that's just a, perhaps it's a simplistic question, um, but it's well, it's I mean, some places it's at the end, it's on top. Okay. Up here, it's underneath. It's got right. Um, right. transparent zinc white on top of it. Um, it's been covered up a little there. So, I mean, the colours come through from the back and they're on the top. And because it's wet, it, it kind of it all joins up. Well, how do you know that? It's, when do you know it's finished? I mean, with this, this is a particular case because, of course, you, 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 you're, you're deciding that's a trip. You're deciding yeah. that the relationship between what were three discrete canvases, but, but on, 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 a, yeah. on a painting like this, at what point you stand back and you say, well, you know? It's just, there's a, there's a feeling, and um, it's not even visual, there's a feeling. And I there's a feeling that it's finished, sometimes I just think, that's rubbish, and I just walk away. And sometimes they finish themselves on their own, when I do that, and I think, oh no, or I'm not sure and I'll just leave it. And then I think at that point they'll finish themselves. Mm. Um, yeah. I visited Joseph Herman many years ago in London and Joseph had in this cavernous uh, uh, studio that he had, I said, well, excuse me, what? He said, well, I common women. But it didn't work, so I covered it over. Oh, yeah. There's a kind of honesty about that. I mean, things do get abandoned then, presumably. Yeah. You will give up. Yeah. You'll paint over it. Or, or, yeah. 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 I, I think it's important to be um, uh, your own critic and uh, select what you, know, the, what you think the best of. It's not always obvious and you I need to live with it for a while or, yeah. or kind of turn it around, turn my back on it. Um, it's easy to be too critical as well. Um, sometimes things you know, that you think are rubbish and you think, oh, I'm not doing any more. Actually, they are the ones to, to keep. But this is why an exhibition like this in Orient Q and Arbeth is important because uh, paint, like, 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 like publishing deadlines, if painters have got to show, then that mm. does focus the mind, doesn't it? And it does, it does uh, help in a way to, for you to make decisions about what's going in and, and how, this, how these things are going to to work in concert, as it were. It does. I, I mean, I like to say I quite like to work in advance because if once you let go of something or it's gone into a show, you, you can't use it in the studio. It's nice to have a yeah. few things around to relate to, remember where you're at. And, and what about this terrible trauma of, of, of losing one of your babies where somebody actually buys it <laughs> and takes it away? And, and then, you know, you, you might not see it again. I mean, people are usually... Oh, yeah, usually not. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I've never really felt that. I mean, it's always good to be able to, you know, to live off of the money yeah. that you're painting, yeah. to buy more materials. Um, storage is a big deal. <sighs> yeah. So to make space, I think I think there's only one sign, and I had a show in um, it's in 2006, and I said to myself, oh, I, you know, I hope there were two paintings. Whoever buys them, you know, I, hope, I hope they're good enough, sort of thing. Mm. Sounds very arrogant, doesn't it? But um, it turns out this, this man bought both, and I thought, well, there we are. He can have both. If he's going to choose what I think are the best two, mm. it seems all right. Yeah. We're in Pembrokeshire, and, and if, if I can end this part of, of our talk, anyway, and say, at what point can you resist responding to particularly in this weather, the, the, the astonishing landscape, the coastal mm. landscape of Pembrokeshire. I mean, that, isn't that much painted, of course? And, and another one of our dear friends, Brendan Burns, has spent the last 20 years painting, really, the light and the rock pools of Kaitabai Bay and, and, and Broadhaven. I mean, that's what he's yeah. been doing and now selling them internationally through Osborne Samuel in, in, in London or whatever. You don't have you can you can you can find the universe in a wood, mm. and you have mm. wonderfully. I think is 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 there the possibility of the coast there for you? Oh yeah, I mean I um, I've always lived on the edge, um, lived near the sea. Um, but in Cornwall, you wouldn't paint your windows white so you didn't have to look out. I <laughs> well, I never had one of those studios. But I mean, even you know Brendan Brendan Burns, he's. It's similar in a way. He's not painting, um, or what I call souvenir landscapes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's not where someone's been and they can take it home. It's obviously they're on a specific place as well, but um, there's so much more to it along with the paint. Um, I think I've, I've done that. And I've worked through it. Um, I grew up in Scotland, not far from the, the big sand dunes and near Fintorn Bay and um, the Murray Firth. And I might get coastal. I keep thinking I'm going to get down to Maros and you know start down there, but this woodland keeps keeps happening. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, there are endless possibilities. Yeah. Could we could we perhaps invite questions from the audience if there are any? I, I, I was wondering with your horizontal triptych whether that was a result of being in the wood, where actually from ground the sky is an important dimension rather than panning left to right or right to left. Yeah. Um, I mean, definitely the, the woodlands and my paintings are very up and down and the trees are up and down, aren't they? And the landscape is, is on the horizontal. But I, I just had this idea to do painting more than one or two panels. And every time it was the usual way, I just kept thinking of um, you know, biblical paintings and iconography and, and how that, or even you get those, what are those mirrors called? So you have the central one and the, what are they called? But it just kept coming back to that for me and the face in it and other sides of the head. So I wanted to make it mine yeah. and I hadn't seen this, I'm sure it exists, Things do, don't they? But I haven't seen this kind of configuration before. So it was trying it out. Um, and th there are, there's, there's the woodland, there's, there's my body, there's what's in my head, there's the experience and how it feels. Yeah, I really love that um, triptych. Mm -hmm. it. it makes me think of sort of when you blink. You know, when you blink, you know the words, and then you see a different bit, and then you see a different bit. Mm -hmm. well, I don't know if that's related. Yeah, and it works beautifully. And your focus is never so broad as a painting can be, can it? Mm. I mean, everything could be in focus. But you use a lot of black and red. I mean, does that mean anything? Um, <clears throat> black. Black, I find a very positive colour. I like using charcoal. It's a 
positive mark, literally. Um, I mean, it can be used in a kind of emotional state, but I find it positive, and black is only really black against white, white against white against its contrast. Um, yeah, I, I started painting, drawing in these woods, and having been in quite an empty landscape, I was surrounded by the trees, and I I don't know what to do with them. Where do I start? And I started drawing trees and uh, doing this painting, and I was um, working with colour. And I thought, okay, I'm going to do some um, colour harmonies and yet light blue and yellow. And I stood back, and it looked like a post impressionist painting. And, you know, it was an alright painting, but it's not what I wanted to make, and it wasn't how I was wanting to make it. So I just stripped all the colour out, and this is where I'm at, and the colour's coming back in. And the pink relates to a Shetland experience, but a light is pink, and I think magic is pink. The panther experience is, you know, it's pretty magical. Uh, yeah, among other things. <laughs> um, so colour's coming back in. It's easy with landscape. To, you know, landscape is blue and green, isn't it? So as soon as you put them in, it's quite obvious. And I wanted to take it away from that while still being about, about being in it, and kind of of nature. I'm looking at some of the work of Cameron Carson, but there is, there is, one wants there to be a sort of horizon line. Mm. And, and the, the one, Drawback of, of the triptych in this way, I think, is is that um, you know that that's the sky, whatever. You know, you say you didn't you didn't necessarily want that, but that that does become the sky. Um, and and but I'm seeing I'm seeing sky above rocks and, and water or yeah. whatever tumbling and light there. Yeah. Um, but, the, but that's what you want. You don't want to be in. You're not an abstract painter. Mm -hmm. You're a painter. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, and the paintings come from the woods and, they, and, and they're, reflect, they're reflecting that. And I think for me, I always seem to have to come back to drawing something. Yeah. Um, coming from something that I see and experience. Um, it's just about taking it further than a purely figurative image. Mm. Um, Do you draw your children? That's a provocative question, isn't it? I have done. Yeah. yeah. But that's for you. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, let's do some more. Mm. They move a lot. When they're sleeping, it's yeah, like, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A final question, question you want? I've written about them more, I think. Okay. I just wanted to make an observation, really, that I really like the way it's hung, but it's quite closely hung. It's got, it really feels almost installation like, you know, there's that sort of claustrophobia, not exactly, yeah, yeah, maybe claustrophobia of the woodland. So the actual hanging has got, is reflecting that as well, which I really like the scale of the paintings in the slightly smaller gallery. It's really great. I think that was my initial kind of problem with the woodland was, was the claustrophobia. Suddenly enclosed by these trees who are, they're all competing with each other. You know, you've just got the canopy at the top. And Fierce, competitive oak woodlands. I mean, it's really intense. But that's that's part of yeah. Yeah. The, this the central European art narrative, isn't it? The woodland, the Germanic woodlands, the place of both safety and threat. Mm -hmm. You know, the the folk tales and whatever. One, whether you want that or not, that's that's part mm -hmm. of the narrative that you join when you when you do these. This is a wonderful exhibition. Thanks for coming on today. I'd urge everyone to make their way to Oriel Q Narbeth, uh, which is a great place to visit anyway. And um, the show is on until the 16th of June. And I think there's no substitute for coming here and standing in the context, as, as you quite rightly say, of what is a sort of installation, an immersive experience with Sarah Poland's wonderful paintings. Thank you very much for Thank being you. so honest and articulate. Thank, Thank you, Sarah. You. Thank you.